Hey guys, how's it going? We're back and we're in the attic. <laughs> Damn it. Uh, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> we got an email from the Sun Times saying, uh, throughout the month of June, we're going to stay uh, with our uh, work from home policy. So, yeah, I tried. Mama tried. Mama tried to raise me right. Whatever that song. You know that song? But no. her pleading, I denied. I got no one to blame because Mama tried. Well, there you go, Ben's uh, still the same old Ben. <laughs> well, For those wondering. Subdued, man. After a week off, I'm like, That's where I'm at. Live stream chat. What's up? Yes, we are back. We are in the attic. Uh, maybe July. Maybe we'll have a 4th of July uh, Chicago Sun Times studio party, huh? Rock on. <laughs> get bad self. Get Denise in there. Get Bandana Bob. <laughs> Denise, Denise. Da, 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 da. Hey, D, you know what else has not What is the same? I can't read my writing. Oh, there we go. <laughs> I'm like, oh, boy. You figure my penmanship would have proved over the week but no 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 negatory but yes our host is still a unique goofball <laughs> i can't read my writing man god damn all right guys live stream chat how's it going way in and we will get this party started your ben Jarofsky show for tuesday june 9th is moments away but before we do this let's thank the following unions for jumping on board and sponsoring this podcast yes they're still sponsors Unions like the International Association of Machinists and Aerospace Workers, not Aerosmith, Local 126 and District 8. That's correct. The International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Local 9. That's correct. The International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 150. That's correct. And of course, today's Ben Jarofsky Show is brought to you by our good friends at the Chicago Federation of Labor. I'm a Trumpocrat. The Trumpocrat, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Blago. Hey, I wonder if Blago's still for Trump, huh? I wonder if Blago still thinks Trump's doing a heck of a job on the criminal justice front. Just wondering. <laughs> Trump seems to want to arrest everybody in Washington. Hey, Blago, how's that going down, huh? All right, Benny J. Let's do a song of the day, pal. Uh, okay. Oh, wait. Let me see if uh, we got a request. Hold on. I'm a little r rusty here yeah, with my song of the day. Say, I have one. Uh, yeah, Very I mean, appropriate uh, one. Oh, really? Okay. okay. Well, you know what? What the hell? Let's do it. Give us one. All right. Well, this song, you know, considering where we're at uh, as a civilization, I think everybody will agree with me. This song's from the 60s. What the world needs now. Come on, D, sing. Is love, love, sweet love. love. It's the only, only thing. thing. And I forget. <laughs> da, da, da. Da, we got mountains and hillsides and something else. Uh, you get the idea. Well, it would have been some great show prep if you learned those words. The Ben Jarofsky Show starts now. It is Tuesday, June 9th, and damn it, from Ben's house, this is the Ben Jarofsky Show. Today on the program, all things what the hell happened while we were gone with the one, the only, Troy LaRavier. And now your host, what the world needs now is Ben, more Ben. Chicago Reader columnist Ben Jarofsky. Hello everybody, Ben Jarofsky here. We're calling this Everything's Changed Tuesday. And here's why. We're back. Yep, yep. As Dennis said, we are back. We're literally back. Thank you, uh, Robert Mueller. Uh, after one week off, a delightful week for it was. Uh, we didn't plan it this way, that uh, like all hell would break loose in our country, in our city, and in the world. Uh, is uh, We did not plan it this way to take that week off. It just happened that way. And so we are back. And we are back in a more literal sense, literally back, as Dennis said, in the, the attic. I know we said before... Uh, we we left for our week off that we'd return to our beloved bright one, our studio just down the hall uh, from the water fountain and the, the washrooms. And the I was determined, one. man. I was like, we're going to do it. <laughs> Come on and join our convoy. We're going back. And I know Dennis kept saying, oh, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to ride my bike down there. I'm going to go check things out, blah, blah, blah. And then we got the email. and whoop, We're right back. And instead, he rode his bike to Wisconsin. In the middle of the week, I got a text yeah, from Dennis. I did that. I, I'm in Wisconsin. I'm like, God. Dang, man. That's a lot long bike rides. Everybody give a big hand. Oh, yeah. It was hell, it was very long. 14 hours, I think it took. Yeah. So, <laughs> what, 14 hours? <laughs> yeah. And then I remember asking you, like, so that, like, if, do you have uh, something to 
fix your tire if you get a flat negatory no nah, man winging uh, it come yeah, on it was he, he's like a uh, acrobat without a net so anyway uh, that's what he did i just sort of sat around the house and chilled out and well actually i was still writing for the reader still still struggling to figure out what goes into my greatest hit book that's another story probably for me and a therapist but uh, anyway we are back and uh so yes we're in the attic so nothing has changed things <laughs> remain the same well uh, shout out to brianna something did change a little bit we did a duet for the song of the day today that's right you finally <laughs> sang along Thank you, Brianna, for pointing that out. And by the way, I think Dr. D did very well. He was like, Ooh, and then he was like, doobie doo doo, boo boo, boo boo. That's the kind of parole he was playing. He was the bass. Sure. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, so some things remain the same. On the other hand, everything has changed. Yes, in so ma many ways, folks, the world is far different today than it was when we said farewell a week ago Friday, uh, particularly on the rela race relations front. Uh, the murder of uh, George Floyd did that. It was, as we discussed this actually before we left, because uh, George Floyd had been killed before we left, so we were talking about this already. Uh, but that we left before the, the eruption of protests uh, throughout the country and in the world. It was a cold-blooded execution. Uh, the way the cop, Derek Chauvin, just looked at the camera uh, when he choked the life out of George Floyd, I think we all agree it was one of the most chilling things. Uh, I know I could say it was one of the most chilling things I ever said. It seen. He looked right at the camera, had his hand in his pocket. Uh, there wasn't even a pretense that uh, his life was threatened by George Floyd. There wasn't even a pretense of a struggle. George Floyd was completely uh, on helpless, lying on the ground. And he just looked up at that camera Derek Chauvin did as if to say, I don't care if you're filming this. I can get away with it. I know I can. And in the aftermath, he didn't. Black people in particular erupted, took to the streets all over the country, all over the world. And this time, white people, by and large, D, I have to say this, did not try to cover it up. And you know how it generally goes. I'm just going to speak as a white person who's had many conversations with white people down through the years. Um, I hope I'm not offending anybody when I say what I say. Uh, but generally, white people, like when a, a black person is killed by the cops or beat up by the cops they always come up with like a, some kind of reason or excuse to justify it I, I, this goes way back i mean i remember when uh, rodney king wasn't killed but he was battered by like what four cops with their clubs and that there was a uh, camera video of that this was before the day of cell phones but somebody captured it on a camera uh, and it was released you just saw these cops wailing away and rodney king. i remember so many conversations with random white people they go well ben you know <laughs> I know you're outraged, but uh, you, know, you don't know what happened before the camera went on. That was like a comment, you know, before the camera went on, we don't know what happened. I'm like, what the hell could have possibly happened to justify wailing away on the guy? You know what I mean? It just, I don't know, it just kind of occurred to me. Uh, Ahmaud Arbery, just about two weeks ago in Georgia, shot while jogging uh, through the streets of his town. And by, a, they weren't even cops, just like some yokels down the street. They saw him running through. They we were suspicious. They hopped in their truck, took their gun, uh, ended up shooting him. And I remember having conversations with people. Yeah, Ben, uh, you know he wasn't just jogging through the neighborhood. He was up to no good. And I'm like, what no good could he possibly been up to to warrant three yokels hopping in a truck and shooting him? But that's just kind of like. I know the mindset of people, just like they're always looking for an excuse. They don't believe what they see in their eye. They don't want to believe that our country is as racist as it is. They don't want to believe that there's so much hatred uh, uh, as as there as there is in this country. But th in this particular case, I got to tell you, uh, I watched the coverage unfold. George Floyd, uh, even Donald Trump, President Trump, said uh, it was not justified at first. That was his first reaction. Uh, John Cass, the columnist, the conservative columnist from the Chicago Tribune, did a whole column. I read it. I was really curious what his response would be, and he concluded this was murder, all right? And then he got really proud of himself for saying it was murder. I kind of, kind of thought that was an interesting thing. I mean, it's sort of like, yeah, you called it what it is, and now what? You want, like, recognition? What, do you want a lollipop or something for having called a murder a murder? You know, like... You, you think you think like you did something really courageous because you said what it was, what it is, or makes sense. I don't know. Mega hat wearers, any so, so proud of themselves for calling a murder or a murder. It's like they're really proud that they correctly identified something. You know, it's like like a big accomplishment in their life. Like it's like me saying that porta potty out there, 
which has been there for three, been looking at that thing for three months now. I look at that porta potty and I go, you know what, D? That's a porta potty. <laughs> that is a porta potty, okay? Uh, now, Did I, you miss this brilliant commentary <laughs> while we were gone, by am, the way? Am I particularly courageous for saying a porta potty is a porta potty? I don't think so. I'm just telling you that's a porta potty. So murder is murder. The man was murdered in cold blood. But uh, MAGA hat wearers want to be proud of themselves uh, for saying that. Look, and then, of course, the week's events unfolded and uh, protest uh, turned to unrest and there was looting and uh, cop cars started on fire. I got, I got to tell you, folks, I have mixed feelings about this. And I'm speaking now, I'll be very upfront and honest with you, as an old white guy. And as an old white guy, whenever I see lawlessness, I get nervous. You know, I have these like flashbacks in 1968 when I was not an old white guy. I was a kid white guy, and I was so scared. I was so scared of the rioting that was going on in the city of Chicago throughout the country after Dr. King was killed. I was just, I, I thought the world was coming to an end. It was a very uh, apocalyptic year, 1968, in some ways worse than where we're at right now. Uh, in 2020. So I just remember being frightened by it all. Like, like pre, uh, you know, pre, my, my thoughts are, can't we just everybody get along? That kind of attitude that I would have uh, back in 1960. Very innocent, very naive, uh, very scared. And so, yeah, same, same sort of feeling, sort of same flashback. I get scared. I get nervous. I feel as though they're, this will uh, ignite a, uh, a backlash and white people are going to just start voting for Donald Trump, and we're going to be worse off than we were. You know, just I'm just being honest with you folks. That's kind of where I'm coming from. And then I get then like my own Walgreens uh, was looted and uh, shut down, so I couldn't get my pharmaceuticals. And I'm reading like people throughout the, the city, on the particularly in the southwest sides, could not get the grocery store, the pharmaceuticals, that kind of thing. But then I I recognize that it's years and years of utter indifference to the ongoing violence against black people in this country and this the ongoing racism that's just so embedded uh, in our law enforcement uh, establishments. It's so embedded right now in the Republican Party. Uh, the, the Democrats are struggling with it in their own right. It's just like at some point it just explodes. And you live long enough, there's reminders that that's what happens if we don't address uh, the problems we don't address the racism so in some ways as scared as I was I kind of welcomed it and it was like what are we going to do what's the next stage you know uh, where are we going to go uh, in the future like to make progress and I am I am uh, uh, I like to make fun of white people a lot but I, I do uh, appreciate that there's like this general sense of wokeness and it's astounding I, it's, it's like I've never seen anything quite like it uh, and, and this goes back to 68. I don't, in 68, there was much more of a backlash by white people against the black people who were rioting. There was much more of a backlash just in, uh, against the civil rights movement in general, and it was tied up to these larger cultural themes. Uh, it was tied up to uh, antipathy to anti-war protesters. It's sort of a class divide among white people in this country. Uh, so it, there wasn't as much uh, unity behind uh, people who in 1968 were demanding justice and change. But it seems as though we've progressed a bit uh, in, in this country. At least people seem to be more aware. And I'll give you an example in the world of sports. I just wrote about this for the reader. So, uh, but I know it's sports, but uh, it relates to uh, politics and race relations, et cetera. Drew Brees, the New Orleans Saints quarterback, outstanding quarterback, had a great reputation uh, for the work he's done, the charity work he's done in the city of New Orleans. Uh, great reputation as a man who was, could get along with all his teammates, was an inspirational leader to all his teammates. Uh, in the midst of last week, uh, I thought it was a good idea to have an interview where he was uh, referring to Colin Kaepernick. And of course, so much of this begins with Colin Kaepernick. If only we had listened to Colin Kaepernick. And let me just go back and remind people who he was. Colin Kaepernick was a quarterback for the San Francisco 49ers. And in the 2016 season, uh, he decided that he didn't no longer could uh, stand for the national anthem. Uh, and instead, he took a knee to protest police brutality. And as you all know, he was banished from the NFL for that protest. The Bears uh, wouldn't tell you. I, I wrote about this last week. I still haven't got over this. The Bears were so chicken to confront the issues 
of that Colin Kaepernick were, was raising. They were so worried about the backlash if they were uh, to confront those issues that they didn't give Colin Kaepernick a tryout, even though they desperately needed a quarterback. And instead, they hired a guy, paid him $18 million, Mike Lennon, and suffice it to say, he was one of the worst quarterbacks to ever play in a Chicago Bear uniform. But that is how scared the NFL and the powers that be were uh, in response to all the issues uh, that Colin Kaepernick uh, was raising. And instead of saying, coming right out and saying, well, you know, we, we really don't want to confront these issues. We don't want to upset uh, law enforcement ties. We don't want to upset the police. We want to make it seem as though all is good in the world. They came up with this explanation to oppose Colin Kaepernick. Uh, which is that he was disrespecting the flag and dis disrespecting uh, soldiers and servicemen. Never mind that there were thousands of servicemen who said, no, no, don't worry, don't do this on our behalf. He's not disrespecting us, you know. And uh, never mind, by the way, I don't know, I can't think of any prominent black servicemen really struggling to think it back now, who protested Colin Kaepernick. You know, it was, like, again, a white thing. And so white people, instead of confronting the issues that Colin Kaepernick was raising, took a duck and a dodge and said, oh, it's all about the flag. And then enough time passed. Uh, players saw what happened to Colin Kaepernick, how he was banished, how he couldn't get a, even a tryout. And they got the message. The fewer and fewer people were taking a knee. Uh, I think last year, I'm not sure if anybody took a knee last year. I can't recall at the moment. Uh, and it seemed as though, like what? The NFL won. They had quashed this rebellion uh, on the grounds that it was disrespectful to the flag. So this made-up excuse that had nothing to do with what Colin Kaepernick was articulating, that was the justification for sort of stifling legitimate uh, protest over a very important and significant issue in our country, police brutality in black neighborhoods. An issue, by the way, that has existed as long as I can remember, going back to the 60s when I first became aware of politics and first started following it. It's like nobody ever paid attention to it in the 60s, the 70s, and the 80s. They kept stifling it, never wanted to deal with it. Uh, so Colin Kaepernick takes a stand and goes, oh, no, you can't do that. You're insulting the flag. So anyway, Drew Brees kind of lost sight of where he was for the moment. That's interesting why he, why he lost sight. I have my theories on this. I've had a couple, many conversations about this with people. All of a sudden felt it was compelled to articulate a defense, of, a defense of being against Colin Kaepernick, if you will. So he was like, you know, it's just re disrespectful to the flag. So he trotted out that old justification, which of course looked ridiculous uh, in the post-George Floyd era. And this is what changed. Whereas that justification was used as an excuse to banish Colin Kaepernick and stifle legitimate debate a couple years ago. Instead, as soon as Drew Brees uh, said it, there was a counter, uh, a, a counter blast, a counter punch led by LeBron James, a basketball player. Started with a tweet next thing you know, Drew Brees' teammates were blasting him with powerful Instagram messages and tweets. Uh, overnight, he was forced to completely flip-flop and the next day he gave one of those apologies that people are so famous for in our society now and then look in my eyes he said i i understand that i was wrong to say that it was disrespectful to the flag the flag has nothing to do with it i was like unbelievable just overnight the whole justification that the nfl had created and established to explain why they were stifling debate and squashing this issue so that it would never be addressed just got obliterated and it was done by Drew Brees. And the next thing you know, Roger Goodell, the NFL commissioner, is saying the same thing. We were wrong uh, to stifle the play. They didn't say anything about Colin Kaepernick, by the way. And no one, as far as I know, no team has offered him a trial to come back. Certainly the Bears are uh, not offering him uh, a trial to come back. You know, so, only so far they're going to go on this thing. But uh, it was interesting uh, that how much had changed just in this one week. Just, just in that reaction by Drew Brees uh, showed how much has changed. And then... Almost right on time, as it couldn't have been planned any better. Oh, President Donnie Trump himself weighed in. And he said, he sent out a tweet that said, Drew Brees had no reason to apologize that he was right, that it was disrespectful for the flag, and we should always honor the flag. 
Freaking Donnie Trump, man. How this guy got elected president. He's you can always you can always depend on him to say the absolutely wrong thing at the wrong time to say it because he's convinced. It's the best way to get power, hold on to power, get reelected. So there we go, folks. Drew Brees has changed. Donald Trump has not changed. Like I said before, so much in this week has changed, and obviously, much remains the same. We got a great show today. Troy LaRavier will be coming on about 2 o'clock. He's got an uh, incredible story to tell uh, about his what happened to him during the protest. I don't want to give too much of it away, but apparently he was arrested. Uh, he was protesting outside of Trump Tower, uh, and he's written a brilliant essay, I think, a very insightful essay on race, racism. Uh, so Troy LaRavier, whoa, Troy LaRavier, the uh, president of the Chicago Principal Association, as you know, um, very thoughtful man, got in trouble because, much like Colin Kaepernick, he dared to speak up back in 2014, 2015, against the school board and Mayor Rahm and the privatization deals and the uh, insufficient janitorial service that was resulting from doling out contracts to companies as opposed to actually hiring janitors to do the job. Uh, he, he got punished for speaking out against all the top-down ultimatums that were coming from Mayor Rahm and uh, his flunkies at the Board of Education. So he paid a price for it, uh, but he's the president of the Chicago Principal Association. He's got a lot to say. Uh, about what went down in this country this last week and what it means. Matt Harvey will be uh, on the show in the second part of the, our segment today. Uh, we will do that interview around 3.30 uh, and drop it at 7, right, D? 7 o'clock tonight, as we do. Uh, we're still back in that game. Uh, That's correct. That is correct. Thank you, Robert Mueller. And Matt Harvey is a uh, outstanding journalist for Tribe, uh, and he spent the better part of last week uh, just out about uh, covering uh, the... the uh, Oh, he was in the south side, uh, the loop, the north side, the west side, just covering uh, the, uh, the unrest. And so he has a lot of interesting insights to offer on that. So plenty of discussion ahead about what went down last week and what it means uh, going forward. Uh, so plenty of uh, discussion ahead. But before we do that, the young man from Alton, he's well-rested. He's tan. He is biked into fitness He's been taking his steroids, and he looks excellent. Okay, I'm not taking steroids. I just wanted to see if you're paying attention. Yes, indeed. The young man from Alton, the man they call Dr. Doobie, with the news. Hey, everyone. How's it going? I'm Dennis. <laughs> Something happened. Hold on, man. I'm caught. It's not COVID-19. It's just a cough. Uh, hey, everybody. We're back. And holy shit, a lot has went down since we last left you. Wait, hold on. Did I just hear you swear? Can we, just, radio. can we just move forward with Whoa. cursing on the show? I don't know. We didn't have a pre By the way. We never have a pre-show meeting. No pre-show prep. What's, I have no idea what he's going to say. It's, it's, but you know what, folks? I still got it, man. Give me that ball. I'm hitting a jump shot. All right? Oh, we're going to find out. Oh, by the way, Joe Colley tomorrow. Dave, I'm very excited. Some Bulls talk. All right, sorry, Dave. Didn't mean to pitch up. Go ahead. And hey, welcome back to the live stream chat, Stephen. What's up, man? We missed you. Uh, he's waited with some hilarious comments, and we'll get to those in moments. All right. uh, let's power forward here and find out what's happening in Chicago and or Illinois this afternoon. Uh, actually, before we do that, Ben, I have to ask you, um, did you see your secret admirer yesterday? Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi. Oh, yeah, she was. <laughs> your thoughts on that? I, I love Nancy Pelosi. Babs, I know it's going to give me a hard time on that, but I love Nancy Pelosi. You know. Was the cloth uh, around the neck a little too much? Yeah, probably. Well, what, you know, better that than what Donnie Trump did. Lock him up, shoot him. All right. So, you know, I mean, uh, I'll take Nancy. Yeah, can we get a politician who's just playing that middle ground? Holy cow. We got Kenta Cloth and then Trump acting crazy. Uh, I'll take Nancy Pelosi over Donnie Trump any day. But there was some funny, uh, who is it? Uh, uh, D.L. Uh, Hewley put it on his uh, Instagram. By the way, do you follow him on Instagram, D? That guy is hilarious. Anyway, he put it out there, and then the comments about it were hilarious, you know? Uh, some people liked it. Some people were like you, though. This is ridiculous. Uh, so whatever. We're, gonna, we're at a moment, one of our moments in history, one of our crossroads here. We'll figure out where we're going to go with this, but I'll take Nancy Pelosi over Donnie Trump any day. Lose the cloth thing very cringy all right now the last time we did this program the following phrase was announced so much that i was beginning to feel a bit nauseous today <laughs> illinois governor jb pritzker is at the thompson center delivering his daily covid 19 press briefing at 2 30 
See, I almost got sick there. Just saying it there. But after, I don't know, roughly uh, 100,000 people in the state of Illinois decided to say the hell with this and went out to protest the wrongful death of George Floyd at the hands of the Minneapolis police two weeks ago, daily COVID-19 press briefings may be a thing of the past. Because today, June Bug Pritzker was at Union Baptist <laughs> Church in Springfield at noon for a roundtable discussion with downstate Senator Andy Menard, a local alderman with maybe the coolest name ever. Listen to the name of this alderman. T. Ray McJunkins. T. Ray, I like that, man. T. Uh, uh, T. Ray's pretty cool. Yeah, that is really cool. The last name was more of McJunkins. McJunkins. What was the uh, McLovin? Remember that movie, <laughs> yeah. McLovin? Who? Who? What movie was that? Uh, Super bad. Yeah, McLovin. Yeah. Pritzker uh, was at Union Baptist Church in Springfield for a noon roundtable discussion with Andy Menard and Mr. T. Ray McJunkins, and he was also with teen organizers of a Black Lives Matter march. Uh, after that, the governor will tour the Decatur Boys and Girls Club child care facility and discuss early childhood education issues. Uh, shout out to all of our small business owners in Illinois listening this afternoon. My God, you have had a rough go at everything as of late. First, you had to shut down or drastically change your whole business procedure due to the pandemic. And then we had business owners who were affected by the looting portion of our protests across the state. Boy, if you haven't already, I'm sure you're ready to start taking up drinking. But <laughs> put that bottle down before you do that, all right? Because uh, Governor J.B. Pritzker is working to help you. The following comes from the Chicago Sun-Times and Tina's Fondellas. Governor J.B. Pritzker on Monday urged insurers to speed up the paying of claims for small businesses devastated by looters and warned that he'd take action against firms that failed to, quote, do the right thing. Underscoring an Illinois Department of Insurance bulletin that went out to the companies, the Democratic governor said that he will not, quote, hesitate to hold any bad actors accountable. That would mean fines and the suspension of licenses depending on the severity of the situation, Robert Muriel of the department, uh, the department director said. Uh, we got a quote from Pritzker, quote, insurance companies must do everything in their power and are obligated to give their customers the funds. They need to rebuild and get back on their feet as soon as possible. Help can't wait. In short, insurers must do the right thing and do it fast with all consideration to assisting business owners to get back up on their feet and reopen as soon as possible. The Department of In this is still Pritzker, by the way. I had a lengthy comment here. The Department of Insurance will be paying close attention to any reports of insurance companies not upholding their policies or standing in the way of our business communities rebuilding. I won't hesitate to hold any bad actors accountable. Yeah. So there you go. All right, good for you, J.B. Pritzker. You know, it's this interesting thing. Um, we talk about this, uh, had many conversations about this over the last year, about uh, one of the ways that you might get the police uh, to stop beating up black people is to hold them individually accountable through, you know, loss of a pension, what have you, uh, if there are too many cases uh, uh, against them. Uh, or cases that have been established where they did beat somebody up. So it's a similar thing. It's like, I don't know, 400 years of racism in this country, slavery, Jim Crow, you know, the KKK, et cetera, and so forth. Uh, there's going to be, there's going to be, it's going to have an impact. So for an insurance company to say, well, we're not recognizing this claim because what, I don't know, it's, it's not covered under a policy. I don't know, guys. I feel as though you've been profiting from this system for so many years. Uh, you know, you, you never had an incentive to what? Take a knee? If you will, I mean, I don't remember any insurance companies joining Colin Kaepernick when he took his knee. You know what I'm saying, D? So they profited from the system. And now the system is unraveling to a certain degree because we have not confronted just all the bigotry, racism, and hate that exists out there. So you're going to have to pay. I just, I, I'm with J.B. Pritzker on this one. I really am. And ultimately, we all know that the government is gonna to have to come in and pay a lot, that, that our country as a whole is gonna to have to contribute. And we're, we have to have some serious discussions about reparations. But I just feel as though this notion that, you know, the, some, this is different than what a storm, the results of an, uh, a hurricane or a tornado, I, I'm not buying it. This is the end result of like years and years of history in our country that nobody paid attention to this stuff. Uh, by and large, or repressed it. Uh, 
We spent, we, Barack Obama got elected president in 2008. Within a year, there was a Tea Party rebellion. And they're to, to this day, they're still trying to reverse anything that a Barack Obama did. They denigrated him from the moment he got elected. Why? He was the most moderate Democrat that I can imagine. Far too moderate, generally, for my taste. Probably Dennis's taste, too. Dennis is a little bit of a lefty. He kind of keeps that covered up. People don't know that. Uh, and... Uh, so, and yet they treated him as though he was this dangerous socialist, communist, you know, saboteur. Uh, and so this was the re reaction to just like a very moderate Democrat who was always constantly at sort of loggerheads with the leftist part of the Democratic Party. Uh, this is this country's got an inability to accept uh, black people in positions of authority and... Uh, particularly when it's the president of the United States. So I, I just think that it's, this is really an important time for all aspects, all segments of our, our society, just to kind of look in the mirror and see where we should head, you know, what, what they should do going forward. Kyle on the live stream chat says, my McJunkins is what I'll tell uh, cops. <laughs> uh, oh, crap, hold on. Okay, yeah. My McJunkins is what I tell Republicans and cops to go suck. Okay, ah, Kyle. Fuck, come on. Kyle. Hey, let's clean it up. Man, what's going Everybody's getting a little randy. All right, Dennis dropped the S-bomb. <laughs> Kyle is McJunkin. Good times. All right, moving on here. <laughs> to defund the police or not to defund the police? Wow. That is the question. George Floyd's death has brought the police and their conduct, or lack thereof, to light all across the nation. We heard the mayor of Minneapolis, Minnesota, Jacob Frey's answer uh, to the question, will you defund the police? No, said Jacob Frey, which led to one of the saddest moments I've seen in political history. Uh, Jacob Frey, did you see this? Uh, walking away, being told to leave. Uh, the city council in Minnesota, that one? Oh uh, no, it was. Uh, I believe it was Black Lives Matter. They were uh, asking him, "Hey, will you defund the police?" And he was like, "Nah, I don't. I don't think oh, I'm going to yeah, do that." Yeah, yeah. And they're like, "Get out of yeah. here!" And he was just walking with his head down out of there. So that happened. But what about our elected officials right here in Illinois? Defund the police, yay or nay? I have the most recent responses from Governor Pritzker and Mayor Lightfoot. Let's read them. When asked, defund the police, yay or nay? Illinois Governor J.B. Pritzker said, "Quote." If defund the police means fundamental change, then Governor J.B. Pritzker is for it. Well, that's, uh, you know, that's a nice way of putting it. I'll get into all this later. Or what did uh, uh, Lori Lightfoot That So that's the ex extent of J.B. Pritzker's comment? If yeah. defund means fundamental change, he's for it. Uh, yeah. Okay, go ahead. What did uh, Lori Lightfoot say? All right. And then he also added that uh, he likes Illinois Attorney General Kwame Raoul's suggestion to license officers. Anything about that? I'm not sure I understand what that means, what the implications of that means. In other words, if you license officers, you could strip them of their license if they do something bad. Is that what he's, what he's so. getting at? Yeah. Well, you could do that anyway. I'm not quite sure. A lot of times these are suggestions that I'm like, it's, it's, it's like... We talked about this a lot before. Remember they were passing new rules to outlaw corruption in Illinois? Well, corruption is already against the rules. What do you need new rules for? You know what I'm saying? So in the case of uh, what happened to George uh, Floyd by Derek Chauvin, murder is already against the rules. You know what I'm saying, D? What do you need a new rule for? But I have to see the specifics of it. I really think that the issue is will, uh, how much tolerance will we as a society have uh, going forward? Uh, for obvious cases of police brutality. All right, moving on. Chicago Mayor Lori Lightfoot. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. When Mayor Lightfoot was asked about the defund the police slogan on Monday, Lightfoot pointed to her 90-day action plan to incorporate new training for officers to better understand the communities they serve. It's an important part of changing Chicago's judicial system, where mostly white officers rule over a system that sees mostly black and brown jail inmates and where officers live in neighborhoods of Chicago that differ from the places that they serve. What did she say about the fund the police? That's all I got for her response. There. Well, I, I do think I saw her say somewhere that she was not going to defund the police. And so the whole I mean, we're going to be talking about this with Troy LaRabier. He said something to me uh, in passing as I was talking to him before uh, the show. He said, uh, she come up with a better term for it to fund the police. And he's going to think of a better term for it. Because the reality is this. And 
I know this because I've been writing about these stories for so long. It's just like bringing back memories. There's so many functions that the police serve these days that they shouldn't be serving. One, the most obvious one is dealing with folks uh, who are like having uh, some mental illness, mental breakdowns. I can think of so many incidences where cops are called, uh, people are hysterical. It's, the cop is not the person who should be best positioned uh, to deal with that situation. I don't know, a social worker, a therapist, a doctor, a nurse, somebody else. And we had Howard Ehrman on the show, and he just talked about how systematically from the 70s on, the city of Chicago has been cutting the ranks of health officials in its health department. And I wrote a lot uh, in the last 10 years about the city of Chicago under Mayor Romp thought it would be a good idea to close mental health clinics in high-crime areas, and Lori Lightfoot wouldn't reopen those areas. The city is very stubborn. Uh, in its attitude toward healthcare officials. They, it's almost like they view it as not unnecessary and they want to get uh, accolades for cutting the workforce by firing the people who could have the least amount of resistance when you fire them. So if you close a mental health clinic in a poor black neighborhood and you're Mayor Rahm, you're going to figure and you say, well, I'm doing it because I'm saving money. You, you know that the people that elected you from the north side of Chicago are not going to revolt. They're not going to rebel. What do they care? They're, they're not dependent on those mental health clinics. That's the kind of political world we existed in, folks, for the last 20 years. Like our all-powerful mayors could pretty much do whatever they want in uh, poor black neighborhoods. And, you know, most white people in the city of Chicago s said, oh, it's okay with me. I don't care. Only a few nutcases. And we were... We were labeled nutcases because we complained or wrote articles, protests, etc. Why you always got to complain, Ben? Come on, man. There's better ways to do this, cheaper ways to do this. I don't know. I don't. I never understood the justification for firing healthcare workers or firing uh, nurses or firing therapists, particularly when people so need them desperately. So like, so this the whole notion you have to rethink what police are there for and what the responsibilities are and what duties and missions they're going to give them. So to send a cop to the house of like a, a husband and a wife who are having in the midst of a huge fight, domestic violence, what have you. I don't know if that's the appropriate use of police officers, you know. And so, yeah, if if you can cut the ranks of police by hiring people to do some of the jobs and tasks that they shouldn't be doing in the first place, that makes sense. You know, it's uh, it absolutely makes sense. But see, here's where the politics of it, R.D., and this is why that mayor in Minnesota, he backed off. Politically speaking, I remember having this conversation with Carlos Ramirez Rosa many times because give Carlos credit. If you want to talk about someone who's ahead of the curve, he was talking about defunding the police long before it was fashionable. And it was a classic old man versus millennial debate, um, me being the old man. And I was like, Carlos, you don't understand, sonny boy. I've been around the block. You can't get away with defunding the police. The public will revolt against you. If you say defund the police, you will lose uh, at, the, at the election, at, the, at the, the next election, because people want police. That was what I said to him. And he goes, no, Ben, you're wrong. <laughs> Do you remember this debate? Yeah, I don't know if you remember. I've had it a couple of times. Carlos, uh, I got to say, your position seems to be a lot more popular today than it was when we had that debate. Uh, yeah, Carlos has schooled you so much in debates. I'm just having trouble thinking about which one that one was, <laughs> you know? Well, what was the one? The cigarette holders? Not his fine at moment? Or what, what was the name of that group? Chain smokers. Oh, yeah, the <laughs> cigarette holders. Remember, Carlos, uh, defending the chain smokers? I was trying to explain to him about Stevie Wonder. He's no Ben. The chain smokers. Yeah, well, I, I, don't, I don't see him proclaiming a victory in that debate, do you, D? So, hey, Minneapolis mayor, take notes, man. BS a little bit. Give him a, you know, Pritzker and uh, Lightfoot. They haven't said yes or no, but boy, they sure danced around it and BS. Well, I, Lightfoot did say, I, I'm almost positive she did say no. So she pulled uh, a fry. And Joe Biden is doing some soft dancing on this issue, too. He's in, he's like doing a <laughs> da, 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 you got a little move here, move there. Well, you know, uh, they, they don't want to get behind a defund the police movement because they're worried that of the backlash. And this is what I was talking about earlier. Our country has a history. This is this is reality, folks. Our country has a history 
when black people ask for too much, white people get a little scared. Like, uh oh, they're gonna take it from me? Uh, they're gonna do to me what I did to them? Uh oh, I'm scared. Backlash. Vote for George Wallace. Vote for Richard Nixon. Vote for Bernie Epton here in the city of Chicago. This is shameful history, folks, that most people don't know unless they're political geeks. And uh, so the fear among many of the strategists surrounding Joey Biden is that if he goes too far to the left on defund the police, there could be a backlash. And all those suburban swing voters in Wisconsin will suddenly vote for Donnie Trump. Now, I think that's madness. Donald Trump is clearly a lunatic. You, you know what I'm saying? I just, but I can't imagine someone who's rational and takes pride in having a logical view of the world could possibly vote for Donald Trump. I've been saying this for a long time, D. I've been predicting this. And I, but I, a lot of Joe Biden's strategists, from what I read in the newspaper, are scared. So if you say defund the police, and this is why Troy RVA says you got to come up with a better name for it. If you say defund the police, you're in danger of igniting a George Wallace, a Richard Nixon, a Donald Trump, a Bernie Epton backlash. And so that's why Fry in Minnesota and Mayor Lightfoot here in Chicago and Joe Biden, they're so cautious. They don't want to go too far. All right? So I guess saying, you know, you can condemn Drew Brees for saying that it's disrespectful to take a knee in front of the flag. You can condemn him that. But defund the police? I'm a little, a little nervous there, Ben. Can you interrupt the defund the police thing? I mean, you got to come up with a whole new slogan for it. What maybe. about replace the police? Yeah, let's write it down and ask Troy what he thinks about that one. Replace right. the police. Looking for some good names here. Uh, if you agree with that, weigh in, or if you don't agree with them, weigh in on the live stream chat. Uh, give us a, uh, a better name for that. Are well, this is, I mean, I just want to say that what Troy pointed out, he goes, and he had a great point. Uh, he'll probably articulate it a lot better when he's on the show. Oh, I'm sure he will. <laughs> <laughs> no, what you're supposed to say is, oh, no, Ben, no one could do it quite as well as you. Oh, Ben, you're great. <laughs> Tell us another porta potty story. Please. Uh, um, porta potty is looking pretty good there. By the way, there was a lot of a lot of porta potty use over the last week. It's from you? That. No, I've still have not uh, visited the porta potty. I just watched it, but I did a lot of work. The, I did a lot of reader work, a writing on this. A lot of writing went t took place last week. It's nice. Kind of, yeah, I went back to the old days. A lot of writing, and so I was constantly looking at the porta potty. But uh, what? No, the point he made was when school, when the uh, when the charter school movement was erupting. And they had to figure out how to brand themselves and how to promote themselves. They didn't call it privatization, which in fact is what it is. They didn't call it anti-teacher, which is in fact what it is. They didn't call it anti-union, which is in fact what it is. They, they didn't call it make teachers work for less, which is in fact what it is. They called it choice. They turned it into like a generic phrase that we can all believe in. Oh yeah, choice. Well, ben, how could you be against choice? And so somehow or other, the defund the police movement has to come up with, you know what I'm saying? It's like, you do that, you're ahead of the game. All right, we got some uh, other Illinois politicians uh, with their thoughts here. State Representative Jihan Gordon Booth says major police reform is a task for local government rather than state and federal leaders. Jihan Gordon Booth from Peoria was on the show a couple times. I don't know if you remember that, Dean. Mm -hmm. And Democrats in Congress, well, like all politicians, they think they're slick. But we all know, like most politicians, they're not. But at least they're acknowledging that there's a problem with the police here. Instead of defunding uh, police, the Illinois Democrats are, quote, pressing ahead with a sweeping bill to crack down on use of excessive force, bolster transparency, and ban certain practices, like chokeholds. Yeah, that's... Long overdue, absolutely, uh, and uh, absolutely long overdue, and it's their way of saying, well, can, can we not discuss defunding the police? But I don't think Carlos is going to let them get away with that, D. Uh, and uh, yeah, so this is, this is one of those uh, critical moments for the Democratic Party, progressive politics in this country. How are we going to move forward in this issue? I think it's absolutely crucial in the most general, abstract way for our city and cities in general and towns as well start thinking in terms beyond just pounding up pounding people arresting people you know what i mean just law enforcement cracking down and go back to uh some of the the, the old ways like howard Ehrman talked about with healthcare workers 
you know, social workers, etc. Just saying that, I could hear the Donnie Trump crowd going, oh my God, you know, you got to deal with hardcore criminals with a social worker. Well, not all people who get picked up by the police are hardcore criminals. And that's the problem. They're treated as such. So I do think uh, that we have to change. Maybe, maybe you can talk some police officers. Maybe there's some police officers out there who would rather be, like, put, take a role that's less of what? The, the law enforcement type. Put away the gun and become more of, like, a, I don't know, a mediator, if you will. You know, maybe that's one way of getting around it so that you don't deal with, like, firing people. But I do believe, we, I think it's absolutely critical that we rethink how police engage with black people. It's so long overdue, D. Like I said, this goes back to the 60s as far as I'm concerned, it went way back beyond that. But I've been watching Chicago wrestle with this for years. So yes, it's time we engage in this discussion. You say defund the police, half the, half the politicians in the state of Illinois are gonna go under this table, man. But that's where we're at. All right, and uh, Stephen on the live stream chat once again, welcome back. Uh, his phrase, "Eat the police." I don't know if that one will work out too well. <laughs> Eat the police. Eat the police. Okay, <laughs> Steve. Eat the police. I'm writing that down. I'm going to run it by Troy. All right. We have replace the police. Eat the police. Yeah, defund the police. All right, these are some of the suggestions. All right, uh, we're going to be reading your live stream chat uh, comments before we end the <laughs> segment out here. Steve, was that Stephen? Yeah, was Stephen. Okay, but we got one more story to cover here. Uh, we may have a new political party in the state of Illinois. Oh. Step aside, Republican Party. Stand back, Democratic Party. Green Party and Libertarian Party. I guess just keep doing what you're doing, I guess. Because the Willie Party may be headed to a voting booth near you. That's correct. <laughs> the following comes from Illinois Politico and the one and only Shia Kapos. Willie Wilson, the Chicago businessman who seems to relish poking establishment political leaders, is starting his own political party. He's running for U.S. Senate, uh, Senate against Dick Durbin under the Willie Wilson Party. The Willie Wilson party. Wow. How many signatures does it say does he need to get on the... Well, we'll go through the story here. He said, quote, my whole thing is to give people some choices. He told Playbook, this is bigger than Durbin because Democrats are trying to take over the U.S. Senate. Durbin, the number two Democrat in the chamber, is seen as a shoe-in for re-election in November. Former Lake County Sheriff Mark Curran is the Republican candidate, and the Green and Libertarian parties are fielding candidates as well. By running as a third party instead of as an independent, there's no limit to the number of signatures Wilson can gather to get on the ballot. For major party candidates, Democratic, Republican, or Independent, candidates are capped to a maximum number of signatures. Uh, according to Illinois Politico, this matters because it's easier for opponents to challenge fewer signatures. And if there's no maximum, it means Wilson can file as many signatures as he is able and absent fraud, even if most are bad, he will still most surely make the ballot. Yeah, well, it depends. Uh, again, the question I ask is how many does he, what's the minimum he needs to make the ballot, not the maximum. I understand the maximum principle. It says here, another year, independent or new party candidates would need at least 25,000 signatures to run right, for 20, U.S. 25,000 is a difficult challenge. So Willie Wilson, I remember uh, Pat Quinn, our old friend Pat Quinn, rounding up those signatures to get uh, the, um, what was it, a referendum on the ballot on, uh, on choice? Uh, not choice, uh, term limits, my bad. And uh, remember the, oh, God, what, Rom and the, uh, Mike Casper put him through on that front. Uh, by the way, the, it, 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 people voted on that. I'm still, I still believe the Mike bet you is that people voted to uh, impose term limits on the mayor, and they just didn't count it. So it's a challenge for Willie Wilson uh, to get those signatures, and you know the Democratic Party lawyers are going to be coming after him. You what? know that, and you know Willie Wilson will relish it. Uh, and if things are this stay, remain the same, Ricky Hendon, our old friend Ricky Hendon, I don't know if Ricky's joining Willie. I haven't talked to Ricky in a while. Ricky was like very busy, too busy to come on our show. Man, right, Ricky, I'm calling you out a little bit. I bet I'm very busy. I'm a busy guy. Uh, there is more into the story, actually. Oh, uh, it says go. here, but a federal judge ruled that because of the COVID stay-at-home orders, uh, hampered signature gathering, candidates this year only need to gather a minimum of 2,500 signatures, yeah. and they can do it online as well. Yeah, so 2,500 is a lot easier than 25,000. I do remember that uh, decision. Uh, and yet, you watch. Those Democratic lawyers are coming after him. And by the way, he, I don't know. 
I tend to be very uh, uh, open-minded, very libertarian when it comes to ballot access. I welcome them all. And uh, in, in this particular case, I don't know if people know this, it's just whoever gets the most votes uh, is the victor. There's no runoff system for U.S. Senate in a Senate race. So if Willie Wilson got one more vote than uh, the second place finisher, he would be uh, the senator from Illinois. If Durbin gets one more vote, he would be the senator. So uh, that I, I favor. Um, I'm, I'm with you, Willie Wilson. Yeah, I, I believe that uh, we should encourage people to run. Wilson says he's already gathered close to 10,000 signatures, while established party candidates cannot gather more than 10,000 uh, signatures to get on the ballot. New party candidates have no limits. Yeah, well, look, if he's going to gather 25,000 signatures and he only needs 2,500, uh, that, that, uh, that sounds like it's pretty easy to do. But I, I'm telling you, D, now I'm thinking about it. They go through these, you know, signatures... Lot, I mean, I remember Willie. You know what? I re, wasn't it Willie Wilson and Ricky Hendon that were challenging all those candidates running for mayor? Mm -hmm. You know, so Willie, I'll put it to you this way: the libertarian in me says, "Welcome to the party." But I'm just pointing out, I, I'm not going to be crying, and don't I'm not going to have you crying on my shoulders when the Democrats come after you, play the same games to you that you play to Jamal Green uh, and Neil South Griffin. Can you believe I remember all these names, D? Give me credit. Yeah. Uh, back in, in uh, and Tony Preckwinkle was doing the same thing to Lori Lightfoot uh, and Susanna Mendoza. So, you know, live by the sword, die by the sword. So I don't want to hear any complaining when they challenge you, all right? Because you did it to them. Oh, God, there's so many people I know who are so mad at Ricky Hendon because Ricky Hendon has challenged so many petitions down through the years. So I still put my money at Durbin. I think Durbin's going to be uh, reelected. All right. Now that's the news there for the day. Let's go to you with the live stream chat. Thank you once again for uh, not forgetting about us. We took a week off and you're still right back here. So that's awesome. Thank you so much. And even Steven made a comeback. <laughs> eat the police all right so let's read the comments here that you guys got going on here brianna says uh she said something about kaepernick oh yeah kaepernick should be reinstated with full back pay well he cut a deal uh and i will be talking about this vincent norman's gonna be my guest on thursday uh this i can't wait for everybody to meet him he's the first timer uh very knowledgeable man about a lot of different things he's coming on to talk about cannabis uh, and the efforts of black people to get some of the uh, dispensary license, but he's very knowledgeable about sports and politics. Uh, and we were talking about, you know, Kaepernick uh, settled with the NFL. He sued him, and then there was a settlement, and it was sealed, confidential, so we don't know what the terms of the agreement are. Uh, and uh, so uh, he already has received some benefits from the NFL for what they did to him. But I'm with you 100%. If he wants to play football, uh, at the very least, some team should invite him in for a tryout. I'm with you on that one 100%. All right. Now, uh, for those who are familiar with the program, every now and again, we got a fellow who uh, weighs in on the live stream chat. His name is Brent. And Brent just makes a simple comment. Ben, you remember that comment, right? Still not voting for Biden. <laughs> well, a lot has changed in a week, I guess, uh, because Brent has weighed in on the live stream chat today and says, I've decided that I'm voting for Biden. Wow. Did he say why? Other than just the I gotta tell you, it's really hard to keep track of uh, everything on the live stream chat. So I can look here. All right, yeah, uh, just give me that, some time. Well, I um, I could see you coming to that conclusion, Brent. Donald Trump was so insane over the last week. He, well, he's been insane from the moment he got into office. And folks, I hadn't even gotten into. I was gonna uh, one of the things I was gonna talk about. I hadn't even gotten into the stuff that the Tea Party is putting out there. They're trying to figure out like a, a, a way in which they could flip where we're heading, we're heading right now as a country. We're finally confronting these issues of embedded racism in our police departments and in law enforcement's uh, relationship with black community. The Tea Party is trying to figure out how they can flip the switch on that and like turn that against the Democrats and engineer the backlash that I was talking about. So it's, again, it's really hard for someone who prides himself or herself on being logical and rational and believing just like uh, we should heading in a generally positive direction uh, to sit out this election. It's just really, because Donald Trump is so evil. So may, I, I don't want, I have no idea if that's... He said, tanks on the ground, yeah. Trump has to go. I'm with you. I mean, that we that was something we missed last week, D. I, mean, I wonder what Troy has to say about it. Uh, where Donald Trump, uh, that PR move, where he had the, the troops 
you know, fire off the pepper spray to clear out the park so he could do his little uh, walk across the White House like he was bold and brave. <laughs> and in reality, you know, he was completely surrounded by uh, soldiers and stand in front of the church with the Bible, which he held upside down. Oh, and you know Monroe's going to be going off on that one, right, D? You know Monroe's going to have a lot to say about that. Uh, and so just everything, the way Trump reacted last week uh, was so despicable that I... I just again, it's. I, I'm with the. I'm an old lefty, and uh, so much of what the Dems do, just leaves me shaking my head. But the stakes in this election are too high, in my humble opinion, uh, to do anything other than but vote for Democrat. Jim says, "Flush the turd, November third. <laughs> Okay, let's get that on a t-shirt. And finally, Kyle says, I imagine Ben spent his week off sitting on a recliner with an oscillating fan next to him, <laughs> bag of chips resting on his stomach, watching Three's Company and singing along with the theme song. No, no, Kyle, that was me. I was doing that. And smoking a bong. Yeah. <laughs> Not really in the Three's Company. Uh, I love, Kyle, I watched... Everything and replace Three's Company with Arrested Development. I love Arrested oh, Development. Oh, nice. I just, I've watched it now like three times. Uh -huh. Just Every time I watch it, I just crack up. Uh, I, so I watched a, a lot of Arrested but, but guys, I got to tell you, I did a lot of writing. It's, I did a lot of writing last week. Uh, and I went kind of back to my old life, which I was, I was a writer, which is a very weird life to have. It was kind of an adjustment. Um, do, do you have another uh, comment? Because I have something I want to say. Well, I was going to ask you who your favorite character on Three's Company was. Three's Company? Yeah. Uh, I liked, Wasn't there a janitor with the keys? Am I mixing that up? I don't know. Yeah. I like I like Mr. Barely. All right? Wait, which one's Mr. Barely? It was an uh, old guy from um, Andy Griffith's show. What's his name? Don Knotts. Don Knotts' oh, character. Oh, I love Whoa! Don Knotts. Yeah, I loved him in the Andy Griffith show. Oh! <laughs> Where's my toothbrush? Wait, am I getting, am I, was, I'm, I may be mixing up my sitcoms. Wasn't there a sitcom where the there was a janitor and he had the keys? Was that Three's I Company? Mean, I'm sure that's a lot of sitcoms. No, right? that three, Three's Company is the one with John Ritter, right? Yeah, yeah, no, John Ritter. I'm thinking of the one that takes place in Indianapolis. Anyway, I have to say this to you, Dee. Uh, we did not discuss this, but I must say uh, my ongoing uh, fascination with Mayor Lori Lightfoot and the Lakefront. Okay, one of my favorites. Oh. <laughs> Lori Lakefront. People love Lori, Lori Lightfoot. Nothing's changed, okay? This is another thing that hasn't changed in the week since I've been here, all right? You know, uh, Donald Trump is still a buffoon and a racist, uh, and we got to get rid of him fast. Uh, but Drew Brees has learned a thing or two. So some things have changed, some things haven't changed. Lori Lightfoot is still beloved uh, on the north side of Chicago. People love Lori Lightfoot, and I think she's now playing to that love. And so this notion uh, that Lori Lightfoot had the guts and the courage to shut down the lakefront because Chicagoans were too childish to abide by her rules, uh, that is just so prevalent in the brains of Northsiders. They've like really bought into it. It's like, this is the kind of leader we need that she will deny us the lakefront because she knows what's good for us. They love that, D. I saw she was 75% uh, positive rating. It was the bright one. They always they had the story, I think it was yesterday. 75% positive rating. And she still, she announced today, I'm still closing most of the lakefront this little light of mine <laughs> i'm gonna let it shine but the park's just west of the lakefront i'll allow those to remain open i just it's like i gotta laugh at some point folks there were protests where there were thirty thousand people body to body okay i mean the notion that i don't know yeah what phase are we in right <laughs> now what phase is this it's like Okay, now we're going back to the lakefront. It has to be closed because there's people jogging, you know. Well, they're uh, technically uh, within one foot, Ben. And, uh, you know, uh, that rollerblader, you know. I'm like, it's like, who are we kidding? There were so many people in the, uh, my God, just all over the city. Uh, in the loop at the protests, in the the north side of the protests. The Lord Lightfoot, uh-uh. Got to look out for that COVID because... Some jogger may get a little too close to the rollerblader. Meanwhile, but they, uh, I'll tell you what I'll do, Chicago. I'll open up the parks just west. And then all the Northsiders, oh, thank you, Mayor. 
Yeah, it's She's weird. so wise. Like I said, it's like when you were a kid and like you would have like a clubhouse and you would make up these rules for the clubhouse. Yeah. And you just kind of forget about the. Oh well, well uh, people with <laughs> pants can't be in the club. And it's just, what what is this? What phase is this I now? Don't know. Like, what's You're, going on? It's the insane phase. Last night I went out. Uh, my dearest friends in the world. Uh, we got together at uh, Cap's house. Cap. Uh, thank you very much for having us for a barbecue. And uh, you know, I was the one guy going, guys, social distance, guys, put your mask. They're all making fun of me. Penny J, come on. And uh, by the way, Cap, thank you very much. The chicken was delicious. Everything was great. It was so much fun seeing friends as we slowly emerge into the next phase. But, you know, Lori Lightfoot wants everybody to know we're, who's in charge, D. So you can't go back to the lake front. Even Mark Brown, all right? You can't take his beloved hell. Nope. But you can go to the parks just west of the lakefront. All right, D? So let's get it straight. And meanwhile, over on the north side, people are going, she's so wise. She's so smart. Northsiders, she's your cool. love for Lori Lightfoot, I don't know. It's just getting a little weird. That's all. We love her, Ben. Stop being so cynical. All right, okay. Good times. <laughs> I right, love everybody. Lori Lightfoot on the north side of Chicago, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> and why? I, I can't believe we, I just now thought of that. Uh, Lori Lakefront. That's perfect. Yeah, well, Hashtag Lori she, Lakefront. She shut down the lakefront. Uh, and, you know, as I like to point out, she kind of flipped the switch there. It was her administration that kind of dropped the ball on that whole lakefront thing. But then she ended up getting blaming all of Chicago and Chicagoans across the city, not in her heads, particularly on the north side. Yep, she's right. We can't be trusted. Yep, she's right. Close down the lakefront. Yep, you're right, Lori Lightfoot. They love you, Lori Lightfoot. And and it did pass. Uh, it was a while ago, but we were on vacation. We never got to talk about it. When the first protest happened and we had that curfew at 9 o'clock, she announced it at like 8.36. Oh, my God. We're going to be talking about that. I'm really looking forward uh, to talking about that with Matt Harvey. Yeah, we were, off, we were off the air for all that stuff. Matt Harvey from Tribe will be here at 3.30. We'll drop that at 7. And we're we're going to be talking about the issues. Oh, I'll never forget that. Yeah, I was um, when they uh, <laughs> announced there was a curfew and then they raised the bridges and closed the CTA. And then everybody yeah. stuck downtown. Uh, 836. All right, guys, uh, curfew at nine o'clock. So uh, you better get out of here. If not, you're in trouble. Uh, by the way, all the uh, the bridges are raised and CTA shut down. So. All right. Go say that outside. Go walk out to uh, the corner of Wilson and Lincoln Avenue and say that. And about 100 North Side, I was walk up to you, don't you say anything bad about Lori Lightfoot. Oh, it's starting to rain, D. Oh, Update, hi. a weather report. Oh, it's weather starting report to rain, rain in Chicago <laughs> with a high of 77 degrees here in Chicago. <laughs> right by the porta potty, it's the Ben Grosky Show. All right, guys, we're going to take a little break here. Um, uh, Troy LaRavie is up next. Oh, and good news, everybody. Shout out to the most talented man who's oh my God, ever this dude is awesome, reached out man. to the Ben Jarofsky show, Michael Girardi. He has a new song. That's right. He makes all these songs that and he sends them to us. Genius. Uh, we've had Bailout. We've had the editorial board, which is Ben's favorite. Yeah, sing it for him, everybody. Uh, ben, sing it. Uh, That's the story for the editorial board. <laughs> I had to go work it through in my head. <laughs> <laughs> Catch him at Improv Olympic, guys. <laughs> He's really good. So you've heard editorial board, bailout. Uh, we had another one. I can't remember what it was called offhand. Uh, a lot of people enjoyed it. Uh, oh, it was uh, tax oh, increment the tiff, financing. Yeah, okay, that, one. That was good, man. So we got that one, and we have a brand new one, the fourth single from wow. Michael Girardi. Michael, got an album. Michael's got an album out almost. This one's called A New Low. We're going to play this song when we come back. Troy LaRavier. It's the Ben Jarofsky Show, live from Ben's Attic. Take it 
correct. That's correct. I'm a Trumpocrat. Trumpocrat, that's right. <laughs>song from michael girardi a new low you're gonna hear it tomorrow the day after that the day after that as well what you think of that song i love it man well you saw me i was playing air guitar and air drums too the guy's got talent man and he's got four songs that he uh so i think we're like his muse you know what i'm saying like we we spark some creative juices in his brain and uh, or circuits I should say and uh, he comes up with these great songs so I think the album's coming out and you can find his uh, work uh, let's see here the band, he has a band camp page alright Mike Girardi M-I-K-E G-E-R-A-R-D-I look him up on band camp you can get those songs that are featured on the Ben Jarofsky show exclusively on the Ben Jarofsky show alright no, oh. ed- editorial board is it's just so concisely brilliant the way he just captures the kind of uh, advice editorial boards give to people. Really right. well done. The wait is over. We now call Troy LaRavier. Okay. Uh-oh, Ben's favorite part. My favorite moment. <laughs> oh, hey, Troy. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, the number I had did not work. Oh, we got his voicemail. Just one second, I'll try and call it again. Oh, there we go. We got Troy here. Hang tight with us, guys, and we'll have Troy. We're live. Let's see. Troy, are you there? our audio board had a week off as well a little rusty <laughs> troy are you there yeah i'm here man oh i sound good troy sounds good troy laravier chicago uh, principals association welcome back to the show always good to be on ben what's happening be nice and <laughs> oh hey that's cool good man what's happening with you hey man i'm loving life right now man i'm, I'm alive i'm thinking i'm producing working um, fighting good old American racism. Uh, can't ask for more than that. Yeah. Well, uh, I don't know about the good part, but it sure is old uh, American racism. <laughs> and uh, so Troy LaRavier, uh, uh, at least once a month, comes on the show. We talk about all kinds of issues. And over the years, we've talked a lot about race. Uh, it's a favorite topic of ours. As long as I know him, Troy. Yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> that's interesting, too, because usually when we talk about race, we don't intend to. And now, <laughs> I think this might be the first time if we get to race, and I'm sure we will. I think this might be the first time we talk about race when that was part of the plan. Well, I know, and because I, I remember there was this one time I've talked about this many times, and uh, when Troy came on my old show, the one I got fired from, and uh, it was happened to be on the day of, that Dr. King was killed. It happened to be the anniversary, may have been the 50th anniversary, and. That was not on our agenda to talk about. We were, I don't know what we were going to talk about. Who knows? Uh, uh-huh. And I just asked you, just in passing, any thoughts? It was like 45 minutes later. <laughs> the interview was over. We had, we'd been talking about Dr. King, uh, how he got killed for being a man of peace. 
And uh, America, in my opinion, has never really come to terms with that. Um, but we are going to be talking a lot about race. And I have a whole list of things. Uh, Troy just wrote this. Uh, I think it's a really insightful essay uh, that I hope the Chicago a reader uh, publishes. Uh, Mastering American Racism. And I, there's a whole bunch of uh, points he makes in there that I'd love for him to elaborate a little bit on. But before we do that, at the top of that uh, essay... You write almost in passing, Troy, that last week you were arrested uh, as part of the protest uh, outside Trump Tower, and uh, the, no more details were given, and so I asked you uh, before the show if you would go into some details. So tell folks what happened the night you got arrested. Oh, sure. Uh, well, we were actually on the bridge heading to Trump Tower. The police, Chicago police, good old Chicago police, um, were blocking the bridge, the other side of the bridge. We were able to get uh, across the length of the bridge, but right at the end, uh, they had a wall there, horses, shields, everything. Now, Helmets. time out. What day was this? Saturday. I got you. Okay. Uh, two Saturdays ago. Yep. Okay, go ahead. So... Um, and, you know, it's funny, though, man, because I didn't intend to be out there. I was working. I typically, you know, I support all protests, but I typically don't put my energy into a protest unless it's organized, that there's a specific goal, that there's a target, that if there's going to be disruption, it's targeted disruption, that's meant to change the calculus of, of some decision makers somewhere and make them do the right thing. Um, that wasn't what this was. But I had a friend who was out there asked me if I'd come. I said, sure. Um, it was her and her sister. Um, two white women. Uh, and that's relevant for the later part of the story. <laughs> um, and so they see the bridge. They see the police trying to shove, they have this wall trying to shove the protesters back off the bridge. Horses, cops, they're just pushing forward, and the protesters are standing firm. Mm -hmm. And so the women that I was with rushed to the front of the line to face the cops. Mm -hmm. um, and so I went up with them and took my phone out to document it all Basically, you know, to give the police a sense that you're being watched, um, that what be careful what you do because it's being recorded. Um, and eventually, the police, you know, there's no dramatic hint. The police uh, arrested them. Uh, they pulled them behind the line. They pulled me behind the line. And I remember asking them, uh, "What made you guys rush to the front?" Uh, and they were like white women, they're less likely to brutalize us. You know, they went up there to basically protect, offer some kind of protection to the people of color who are up there. Um, and I just, that floored me. Um, and, you know, I got arrested and I spent uh, the night in jail. Uh, they put me in a cell with 30 other men, most of whom, interestingly enough, were white. Most of the protesters that got arrested were white. Uh, and many of them, I was not surprised, but many of them were. Uh, I heard their stories, and you could see, like, they, they police jacked these folks. I mean, really brutalized these folks. Um, and again, anyway, put me in a 10 by 20 cell with uh, about 30 folks, uh, many who didn't have face masks on. Uh, for the first three hours, they finally gave us face masks after three hours. But I mean, <laughs> damage is done at that point. Um, and I got released the next morning at around seven from uh, captivity. Do you now? Uh, you said something there that floored me. Go go into that a little bit. You were talking about with when you asked the two white women why they went to the front, and they explained they were doing it uh, to uh, out of a desire to. Uh, protect the people of color, the black people, uh, from getting brutalized by the police. What did you mean by that floored me? Uh, it floored me that, I mean, it is, the logic didn't floor me. The fact that they had it within them to do it mm -hmm. was what floored me. I was like, you know, 
I mean, I liked it. I mean, I liked that. Like, I was like, you know, I was impressed by one of them. You know, uh, we had just we had just met because we were both trying to help a mutual friend, a mutual friend of ours. I didn't know her; she didn't know me, but we both knew this mutual friend. And the mutual friend was having some challenges. I was helping him on my end; she was helping him on her end. And then we were trying to get him to do something. And she ended up finding my number and contacting me to try and get me to help her and for us to work together to get him to do what he needed to do. And that's how we met. And I was really impressed with her. And we started a conversation, uh, hanging out. And so I just met her like, you know, maybe a week beforehand. And so when she said that, it was just like, oh, man, I got good instincts because these are good people, right? Um, so that's what I meant. Just like, the ability of, you know, a white person to be that much of an ally. I mean, we've seen it throughout history, but to see it right there in my face and in a, in a human being in front of me and watch it happening, um, you know, it was, you know, it was a powerful moment for me. Uh, so you're in a 10 by 20 foot cell with 30 other people with about 30 of you total, uh, I suppose there's, you're what? There's, you can only either stand or sit on the floor. Uh, and, Pretty much. And, and how long did they keep you in that cell? 12 hours. 12 hours. Um, yeah, there was one guy who was actually the ex-boyfriend of the sister of the woman who I went to the protest with. stood the entire time. The entire time. Uh, all 12 hours, overnight. Um, he uh, told me he was a key grip, and he stands up. Well, not a key grip. Uh, one of those one of those folks in the movies who handles the camera. Yeah. Uh, he was like, that's all I do is stand up all day. There's nothing. But there was barely, I mean, people found a way to lay down. But it was like, I mean, if you lay down, you didn't have much room to, to roll over. It was just like you had your little, people found their little spot. People curled up in corners. Oh, one dude step under the bench, <laughs> and then another dude step on top of the bench that was there. Um, and it was a lot of lively conversation. One, one really deep thing. Another thing that happened um, after it was this really quiet uh, brother, young black man, looked like he was in his twenties, mm-hmm. over in the corner. It was a lot of talk, and I tried to be quiet. And there, was, there were arguments happening. There's, there's this one argument that was happening between uh, two black people, uh, this uh, gay black guy and a straight black guy. And they were going back and forth so much that I finally came in and just intervened and tried to help them to hear one another. And I was successful in doing it and then talked a little bit about larger issues and then left the conversation. So two days later, I get a Facebook uh, message from a woman and she says, my son is, and then she says his name. And I'm like, who is this? I'm like, wait, I don't know this name. Like, uh, is this name supposed to ring a bell for me? Um, and I didn't know how to say that to her. <laughs> and then she sent me a link with a picture. And the picture was this quiet brother who was over in the corner of the cell. I'm like, oh, that's the brother from the cell. Yeah. And she said, my son spoke extremely highly of you. And I would, and I would like you be his mentor um again that was like to, to think that you know you're, you're talking and the people in the room and you have no idea what kind of impact what you're saying is having those folks uh and so that was a good moment for me as well what was the argument over between the the gay black man and the straight black man oh god man so First of all, the straight black man was talking from the moment I got in the cell. I mean, he just he was just going on and on and on how he got pressed, this and that, philosophy, young brother. Um, and then the gay guy chimes in and he says something like basically, you know, the queer community, the transgender community is out here, is always out here allied to, you know, this the issue on the issue of race, but all too often, um, many of the straight brothers are not out there as allies with the transgender community. So that was the and so the brother got extremely defensive, 
Uh, and that took that led to a back and forth that was almost never ending until I was able to come in and, you know, help them hear each other. <laughs> Could you imagine if you're the guy under <laughs> Uh, 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 under the cot trying to get some sleep and there's this debate going on. <laughs> it's almost comedy, man. Well, nobody was sleeping. Nobody was sleeping at that point. And another interesting thing, when I, once I got in the cell, it was, there was already about 20 people in there. And when I walked in, everybody clapped. Me and another guy, well, I was put in with two of us that came in. Everybody clapped. And then after the next guy, but they, like, they just created this pattern. Every time a new guy came in, they gave him a round of applause for being, you know, for being a protester, getting arrested. Uh, it was an interesting dynamic in the cell. And then when people got released in the morning, everybody clapped for everybody that got released. Um, it, it was a memorable experience. What, do you know where the the holding cell was? Where, where were they holding you? Oh, uh, Harrison. Um, uh, my kids being Harrison, I think, yeah, they around that there. area. Uh, and so what, what did they, they killed you for 12 hours. Did they make you pay uh, a bond to get out or how the, was there any financial? No, no? no, I didn't have to pay a dime. I'm assuming they, I bonded me. I think my court date is the 22nd and I probably need to sign that piece of paper so that, um, I will make my court date because <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't, they gave me a piece of paper that had a court date and a location and somehow I lost it. So I probably have to go online and figure out how to find out you know what that was uh i think the charge they, they had two charges on there one of them was disorderly which is yeah i'm just standing there holding the camera uh and the other um, and the great thing is i have my entire arrest on film <laughs> the whole thing so um disorderly and something about a gathering of three more people to do x y and z uh those are the two charges on my uh sheet of paper they gave me so so essentially the police if i'm getting it correct form it's like i'm i'm at this image of the edmund pettus bridge uh in selma 1965 <laughs> uh and so the police are at one end they're at the uh, northern end of the bridge keeping uh the protesters from coming into the michigan avenue uh shopping district where the john hancock building is further down that kind of thing the wrigley building uh, as Not quite. It's, a, it's the Wabash Bridge. It's the Wabash Bridge. Uh, right on the other side of the Wabash Bridge is Trump Tower. Ah, uh, so, Trump Tower. So, the, so they were protecting wow. Trump Tower while people were breaking in the stores all over the loop. They were trying to keep people from demonstrating. I mean, no one. I mean, I know I, I didn't have any goddamn intentions on breaking in the who. I mean, no, there's a, there's a, I seriously doubt if anybody's going to try to break in the Trump Tower. You know. The, the idea was to protest in front of Trump Tower. Um, and they fought like hell. The city put a lot of resources into protecting Trump Tower. And, you know, and all I could think about is the mayor's speech a week early talking about, fuck you, Trump. And I'm like, well, I, that, that fuck you only goes so far, apparently, uh, because she is really putting some serious resources into keeping us from protesting in front of that building. Wow. So essentially, uh, the people at that bridge, and I don't just where you were, I know that bridge, uh, there's a statue at the end of that bridge uh, in honor of Cup, the, the, the legendary Chicago journalist. Anyway, uh, the people, that, that was intended, you were arrested as part of an effort to protect Donald Trump's building. Uh, which, exactly. Wow. Exactly. And you know, another thing, though, you know, Watching the cops, like you see, I saw everything from cops. I saw people who had the necessary discipline. First of all, they shouldn't have been there. But, you know, if you get the orders to hold the bridge, push the protesters back, you know, I saw people who carried out that ridiculous order with the discipline that is required of someone in that uniform. You know, I don't use the word strength. I think it's ridiculous to use that word because it implies that there's something that, you know, like that you should not, that, that, that requires you to exercise restraint. Like that, that there's, there's a debate. There's some, you know, as if it would be justified if you did, like, but discipline is the word that I think uh, should be used. And it seems as though 
that many of them did. And then you saw some who were just outright like rabid dogs, you know, who would just really go after folks. And then you'd see them trying to restrain themselves when the camera got on them. Um, you saw the, the, the unprofessional way that they interacted with protesters, the yelling, the pushing, um, and of course the beating. Uh, I saw them push a woman down and put his knee on her back. Um, you know, that kind of stuff. And then, of course, the guys who got beat down in my cell, you know, I didn't actually see them, but I saw the consequences of it. And so, you know, seeing both of those sides of the police force, folks who can exercise a little discipline and folks who have absolutely none. Uh, and it wasn't a few bad apples, man. It was like half a bunch. I remember when they walked me, when they walked me past, the guy who pulled me in, Pulled me in knowing, because I was looking, I was like, dude, I ain't got, I got no beef with you, man. <laughs> like, I got beef with this, with, with, with the policies and practices of the person that this building represents. So he pulls me over and pulls me, tries to take me over to the curb where all the other people who had been pulled over were sitting in handcuffs. And, a cop, and I still have my phone in my hand from filming. Another cop comes over to me, grabs my phone, and tries to snatch it away from me. So I snatched it back from him. And he looked like he was about to rear back and hit me. And then the cop who arrested him, he had me, says, no, no, man, no, he's cool, man, no, he's cool. And I'm thinking, wait, so if I wasn't cool, <laughs> you sh- it, it, it'd be all right to beat me? It'd be all right to go ahead and finish what you were doing with that baton? Like, I'm just holding the phone, man. Um, again, man, I saw some everything. Um, but fortunately, I got through most of it, you know, unharmed physically or mentally. And frankly, came away with some, uh, some memories that I'm glad I have. Now, the, the police that uh, were on the bridge, were they mixed black and white or were they mostly of white? I couldn't tell you percentages, but there were certainly a few black ones there. Matter of fact, one of them came up to me, recognized me. He was the, uh, he was like, principal. <laughs> and I looked at him, and it turns out he was an officer who would show up to my school sometimes. Um, that was the district that he was assigned to. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and the guy who arrested, not the, the guy who, uh, booked us at the station and sort of uh, was pretty much with us the whole night, letting us go to the bathroom, open the cell processor. Really good brother, black guy. Um, I mean, he exercised a great deal of discipline because there were folks in the cell yelling bullshit at him. And the man was just trying to do his job. Uh, and he did not have to be as hospitable. <laughs> Yeah. As he was, because he was extremely hospitable to us. Young black guy told me that he went to, he and I got in a conversation, told me he went to Al Ray when Janet Jackson was a principal. And, you know, he told me how much he liked her. And, yeah, I told him how much, I told him how I felt. <laughs> <laughs> and we had, and he said, well, I'm not getting, and I told him, you know, I gave him reasons for it, specific instances where things were done. And, you know, he's like, well, I understand. I'm like, you understand you too, man. I mean, you got to love your principal, right? Uh, but he was just such a good brother. Uh, very professional, very disciplined, did not let himself get baited into a lot of the stuff that some of the cats in the cell were trying to bait him into. Um, and at the same time, the guy came in for the morning shift was one of the most foul, despicable human beings I have ever seen in my life. I mean, just despicable, cursing out every single person for every single reason. Ask the guy his name. The guy says, my name is um, something like uh, Brower, and he starts to spell it B-R, and he says, don't spell your fucking name to me, motherfucker. Just tell me your fucking name. I mean, it was crazy. And he talked like that to every single, just about every single person that was being processed out. Um, again, man, and he did it in front of, I mean, it, it was a, 
with at least four other officers. Like, this is just like, this is how you normally are. And he was cool with that. They all seemed cool with that. Like, there's just no, like, that person should not have a job that gives him a salary from public money. <laughs> he just should, but he does. And he felt very comfortable being uh, abusive to just about everybody, verbally abusive, and if not mentally abusive, to just about everybody who was being processed out that, that morning. So, uh, again, yeah, man, I saw it all. Uh, now, I have a couple follow-up questions about where we go from here, but let me just remind everybody that there was a moment uh, when Troy LaRavier uh, was a candidate for mayor of the city of Chicago. Ultimately, Troy decided uh, not to go forth with your uh, campaign. But let's say you were the mayor. Let's say you had prevailed, uh, and you were in charge of uh, the situation uh, last Saturday. How, how would you respond? It? How would you uh, if, uh, determine where to put the police and uh, what message to send? How would you have done things? Well, first of all, your priorities. It's all of that depends on your priorities, right? So, number one, what are your priorities? Is it to protect the protesters? Is it to protect property? Is it to stop buildings from being broken into or businesses from being broken into and stuff taken from? What's your priority, right? Um, and then, if those are your part, your priority, you talk with the professionals about how to best accomplish those priorities. You know, what I saw didn't seem to have anything to do for many police with protecting the building, uh, protecting the protester. You know, you know, they were about clearing people off the streets. Right? So that certainly would not have been my priority. Right? You have a right protest. You have a right to be in front of this building. Uh, hell, if there's any building in America that people should have been in front of protesting, that meant was it. Um, and so you set priorities. You want to protect property, and you talk with the experts about how to best deploy resources to protect that property. Um, I think that you know, the city came out with these signs that I thought was quite interesting. I don't know if you've seen them, but this business demands justice for George Floyd. I thought that was intelligent, right? It's basically a signal to anybody who might break into that building that, hey, and that's another thing, too, man. I saw this sign that says, uh, um, black-owned business, <laughs> right? And it's a sign that a lot of black entrepreneurs put to the windows to let folks know, hey, uh, this is, I'm one of y'all. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm one of you know I'm one of the victims in this whole uh, systematic racism uh, issue, so don't try to victimize me. And the sign, the sign, the black-owned business sign, and the uh, this business supports justice for George Floyd sign are both put in those when those resources are put into creating them and getting them up. Because there's an underlying assumption that goes totally against the other narrative that they try to put out there. They try to say that the folks who are breaking into these businesses and looting are just using it as opportunities. They don't care about the protest. It's just criminal activity, blah, blah, blah. If they thought they didn't care about the protest or if it was just criminal activity, then those signs would have absolutely no impact at all. But they know that Behind those windows getting broken, behind the loop, there is a just there is a target in their mind, right? No pun intended, <laughs> but there is a target in the minds of the protesters that there is a reason, a justifiable reason for, or at least an understandable reason for wanting to destroy, wanting to smash windows, wanting to break in and pick that there is some kind of logic there that's beyond selfish, that there is some outrage behind it. And you know it, otherwise you would not be, the city wouldn't be spending all this money getting businesses signs that say this business supports justice for George Floyd or black owned business. 
Um, I know that was a long roundabout answer to your question. It probably wasn't a direct response, but I just when I thought about when I was thinking about businesses getting broken into, I remembered those signs and I wanted to make that point. Well, you no, know, I was. I've been thinking a lot about this, and I'll be discussing this with my next guest. I'll probably be talking a lot about about the week. Uh, there was some debate again. We were we were off air last week, so we didn't have these discussions. Uh, but it's okay because now people have time to think and reflect. Uh, and they're not in the spur of the moment. Uh, you know the way in which um, it. So many people said, well, the city was protecting the downtown area. That was their primary concern, protecting the downtown area, and didn't care about the, uh, the, the neighborhoods. And I've been thinking about this. You know, how could uh, resources have been distributed in such a way as to protect neighborhoods and leave the downtown more vulnerable? Uh, I, I, I don't know. I have no answer on well, this, Troy, but go ahead. Well, the other thing, the other thing is, what besides policing is going to stop the loop or stop the, like, protect these? Like, the thing that the man D.C. did. I mean, come on. You think people are going to be looting on that street? The street that where the mayor had Black Lives Matter emblazoned for a city block mm -hmm. on the ground. Renamed the street, right? She took the energies of many of those folk who may have wanted to bust into something to express their outrage and put those things to productive use. You know, that was creative. That's the kind of thinking we need when we want to say, when we want to um, have these conversations about, you know, not just how to protect businesses. Because, I mean, when the issue is how to protect businesses, you when, you're, when your main thing becomes how to protect businesses, you've already failed. Like, if you know that the outrage over George Floyd's death is the thing that's going to end up getting these businesses destroyed. Your main focus has to be the outrage over George Floyd's death. And when that becomes your main focus, then you will create, you will come up with creative ideas mm -hmm. that will have as a side benefit. You know, that's not your goal, but they will have as a side benefit that Far fewer businesses will be destroyed. Far fewer businesses will be broken into because the public sees the city leadership um, on their side, actively addressing uh, and, and responding to their righteous outrage. Um, and again, I don't, I, I don't see a better example than what the mayor of DC she did when she put Black Lives Matter on that street. A thousand projects, like a thousand things like that, pushing, announcing that we're going to revisit um, how we do policing yeah. in terms of many of the um, uh, recommendations that are inherent in the calls to defund the police. That's the kind of thing that's going to, you know, one, actually address the problem, which should be your main focus, and two, have the side benefit. Uh, saving some of uh, saving some property from being damaged. All right, you you mentioned defund the police. Let's go there. You and I talked briefly about it before uh, I went on the air. I sort of teased our conversation uh, about how you were saying that maybe there's a better uh, phrase uh, uh, that the proponents for the defund the police movement can come and come up with. Yeah. Talk, did you come up with a better phrase? With no? Okay. <laughs> I didn't put any thought into it, man. I was still writing, um, trying to finish up my piece. But, uh, you know, the point that we made, though, is that the the tagline, be from the police, you know, the things you say to your allies, there's things you say to your enemies, and there's things you say to the general public. There's things you say to your allies. There's things you say to your adversaries. And this messaging, like this targeted messaging, right? So I'm sure the people who want to privatize public education, when they're together, they just say it. Yeah, we're going to get these goddamn public schools shut down and we're going to profit. Like they, they don't have to, they don't, you know, sugarcoat it. But when they come out into the public, they say, we want school choice. <laughs> we 
right? They come up with messaging for the public that's designed to either disarm the public, get public support, or um, protect themselves against resistance. Um, and so instead of saying we're going to privatize schools and try to make money off of public education, they say we're going to create a system of school choice. And they come up with all kinds of extra talking points. And it's effective. Meanwhile, us over here on the progressive side, um, we're not that sophisticated often. you know. And so I think many of the goals uh, that are... Uh, under the big tent of the defund the police movement, many of them, like, they get lost. Yeah. They, they, they aren't even represented in the term. Like, the, the term defund the police represents a small part of what that overall thing is, and two, it doesn't even represent the, the monetary aspect of it 100% accurately. And it gives it, it, it puts the adversaries on notice it gives them a talking point against you that is perfectly suited to misrepresent what you're trying to do um and it's going to it 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 it, 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 it makes the effort an uphill climb from the beginning you know the charter movement and the school privatization movement they, they kind of have an uphill climb now because People got to see the results of it. <laughs> What's the results of it? But I mean, they had like a ten years free, ten fifteen year free run before people were like, oh wait a minute, <laughs> this shit is destroying public education. Yeah, right? because the messaging was so good, um, and we have to get messaging like that. You know, not deceptive messaging, but at least tr messaging that uh, highlights the the positive uh, aspects of what we're trying to do. You know, defund is not a positive statement. No, I, like we're trying. We're, we're not trying to just destroy something. We're trying to create something, and what you're trying to create is not represented in the tagline that you use. And what you're trying to create, if you found a tagline for that, would be much more likely to get you public, get us public support for what we want. Yeah. I mean, so much of what what you went through, what you saw. By the way, just uh, briefly go back to. Uh, I just have to say this, when you were talking about the charter schools and how things flip, and they flipped here in the city of Chicago, and you know this because you were a principal of school in the north side, there was a point, uh, I forget the exact year, where the north side of Chicago said, made it clear, we don't want charter schools on the north side. Yeah, I remember that. And, and, and Rom backed off. That's his base. He just backed off. And charter schools, if they were going to come, were going to be in on the south side or the west side or in Hispanic neighborhoods. It was amazing how it happened. And I, when, when you told me that story about the two women uh, who went right up to the cops uh, at that bridge, at the Wabash Bridge, and said, we're here uh, because we feel that our white presence will keep people from being brutalized. It's not unlike the charter school thing, uh, Troy. Where when the well-to-do, relatively well-to-do white people on the north side said, no way, boom, that ended things with the charter. I don't think they've really recovered from that moment, uh, Troy, politically speaking, in the city of Chicago, the charter school movement, since the north side yeah. said. Yeah, and to be clear, the, the women didn't act like they were invincible. They know they could get their ass whipped, whipped too, but they felt like it was less likely. Yeah. They had a better chance. Um of redirecting some of that violent energy from police officers if these two white faces were in front of them. Mm -hmm. uh, they didn't necessarily see themselves as bulletproof or some kind of guarantee. So I don't want to overstate what they said. No. But I just thought it was um, a hell of a thing, a hell of a perspective to have and a hell of a thing to do to back it up. Yeah, no, I... I... I'm with you 100 percent on the the whole terminology to fund the police, but the protesters have really uh, got me to look at the world in a new way. And I I remember when Chewy Garcia ran for mayor against Rahm in 2015. One of his first provisions was to hire a thousand more police, and oh, that was his attempt to win over 
<laughs> and both of us voted for the guy. At least I did. I, and, uh, you know, that was his way to win over, uh, like, middle-class Chicago, whatever, you know, white Chicago. I don't I, To show that he wasn't just, like, this, uh, the, uh, the radical that Rahm was painting him as. That's how he did it. Uh, and it's just unthinkable at this day. You might say a thousand more health workers or social workers or nurses or doctors or you, therapists. You know what I'm saying? Clinician, you know, but not police. That would not be a, an argument that any progressive would make. So things have changed just in uh, the last. Yeah. Week. Hell, um, when I ran, uh, I think there's an interview right at your beloved bright one with a uh, friend, Spielman. I think it was a video interview that we were talking about. I didn't use the terminology defund the police, I don't think, but based the basic uh, spirit of it. I talked about moving resources from um, law enforcement to schools. Um, and, you know, I, I may I, don't know, I may have been one of two or maybe the only one saying it back then. Um, and I remember thinking at the time, I need some better terminology. And I never got around to develop it. But, like, we need to get together and come up with you know, some, some messaging that increases public support for what we're trying to do. Uh, and one of the issues that's been erupting uh, as well in the last uh, week or so is the notion of police in schools. Uh, you're a principal, you were a principal, you had the Principals Association. What's your attitude about police stationed in public schools? So police as they exist right now, um, and again, so there's police as they exist right now, and then there's sort of law enforcement as we might reimagine it in the future. As they exist right now, um, I'm not in support of it. I certainly would not want one stationed in my school. Um, I think the way CPS went about it was basically let principals decide, um, at least in the last year or so, whether or not that's what they want. Um, yeah, so I, it's not something that I thought a whole lot about, to be honest. Um, but, I mean, if we're trying to get defund police, so to speak, and reimagine policing or law enforcement and community safety uh, outside of the school, it makes, I mean, perfect sense to be even more intense about it inside of the school. Um, that saying, I remember we had police at Little Village when I was an assistant principal over there. Um, we just happened to have a couple of really good ones who were pretty hands off and um, attempted to be of service to the administration whenever they were needed. Uh, they didn't try to jump into situations and, you know, roughhouse kids. Um, but you don't want to put yourself in a situation where, you know, you're just at the mercy of the luck of the draw. <laughs> you just happen to have some disciplined people who uh, seem to know what they're doing. And then, of course, there's the bigger symbolic uh, aspect, whether you get a good one or a bad one. Just the idea of meeting an armed police officer in a school um, is a questionable one. Um, uh, Troy LaRavier, uh, I have to say we're out of time. I have this whole essay that you uh, wrote, uh, Mastering American Racism. And uh, I'm going to do what I can to get it published in the reader. I'm going to suggest that they publish it. And I think the next time you come on, we should just break it down because uh, it, Troy, very effectively, in my humble opinion, uh, just takes us through so many important issues like why racism exists in this, in this country, uh, what is it a tool for, uh, why is it so effective to people in power? How we are influenced uh, in ways we may not even be aware of it, like racial bias that just creeps into our head. There's a song, Stevie Wonder, it creep in. It just creeps into your head. You don't even, you don't even know that it's there. Uh, I, I think he was talking about love, not racism, but whatever. Uh, <laughs> it's just, and uh, it's, it, it, it is uh, some powerful stuff. Uh, mastering hey. American racism. And so the next time you come on, we'll take the deep dive on that. All right, Troy? 
All right, brother. Always a pleasure. And uh, peace to you too, D Nice. <laughs> hey, cool. Yeah, thanks, man. D Nice. D- <laughs> the great Troy LaRabier, uh and uh, had his encounters with Chicago's finest this uh, last weekend. Uh, and thankfully, he lived to tell the story. I'm going to follow up on that and make sure uh, they don't throw the book at him and punish him uh, even more than they've already done. Got to say, D-Nice sounded a lot better than uh, White Lightning or Dr. Doobie. I don't know. I kind of like uh, White Lightning. Uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, we'll switch to that. Any updates, D, before we uh, head out the door? Uh, I mean, nah, we're good. We're right, good. We're let's, good. Let's, let's, we did pretty well on our first day back. Let's just, you know. Stop while we're ahead, huh? How about All that? All right, we'll stop while we're ahead. I want to thank Troy Correct. Robbie. Eh? Uh, great job he did. And, of course, I want to thank the man, the myth, the legend, the pride and joy of Alton, Illinois, without whom this show could not be done. And as you know, back home in Alton, they call him the nice Yeah! <laughs> Keep... Oh, he likes that. Oh, yeah, that's cool. D nice. I don't like white light. Yeah. <laughs> uh, keep yourself raised. Take it out of petty cash. See you tomorrow, everybody. Hey, and don't forget, you can download previous Ben Jarofsky shows and all those Benny J bonus interviews at both Chicago Sun Times and Chicago Reader websites. And wherever else you download your favorite podcasts, follow us on social media at Benny J Show, B E N N Y, the letter J Show, on all the social media pages, and at or Benny J Show at gmail.com. Steven, I got your email. I'm going to show that to Ben. Maybe we'll talk about it tomorrow. Take care. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. I'm a Trumpocrat. The Trumpocrat, that's right. Best concert? Yeah, Steve Miller Band and the Eagles. That's correct.